Um, before I have the city clerk call the roll, I will say um, Mayor Natal is out with an injury and um, Councilman McEldowney has asked to be excused. I have not heard from Councilman Johnson. So that being said, will um, the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Natal. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Snyder. Present. Councilman Moreno. Here. Councilman Benson. Here. Councilwoman Carson. Here. Councilwoman Teeter. Here. Councilman Johnson. Councilman McElvain. And Councilman Hoy. Yeah. Mayor Brooks and Snyder. Thank you, ma'am. Will the audience please rise for a moment of silence and then join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Morris came up with some very good information 
the energy in that community is huge. And again, I want the council to be aware of it. A food market can definitely be there by the year 2012, which is too late. Uh, we need to do something very quickly. There's a lot of support. I felt those three and also everyone else did a fantastic job. But in my community, we're definitely in need for it to happen. But I want you to know, Mayor Pro Tem, that uh, there's a lot of folks out there that are really want to have this happen. We need it. I encourage the council to do everything they can to make a real food possibility. And also think green. It gives a wonderful opportunity for the community out there in Reunion or Northern Commerce City to come up with a food market that can be developed to be very green oriented to be a, definitely a, in my mind, a truly outstanding project but an example of being shown what can happen. Again, I do appreciate the efforts. Again, Forrest was fantastic. He definitely does know about $59 million out there and also $88 million we have working for other uh, things out there for going out and dining, but uh, it's good to get some feedback from you. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you being here. Councilman Moreno, do you have for us? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Newsom, thank you, as always, for, for coming to the meetings. Um, I was at Mr. Benson's uh, board meeting as well, and I agree that that is the number one issue for, or number one concern for residents in the north. Uh, and it remains uh, the top priority of this council. So I think that it's, you know, there's no shortage of, of participation of the north, and I think that's terrific. I think that community is really uh, waiting for something. Um, for example, uh, I, I've had multiple discussions with uh, another gentleman who lives up north, Mr. Scanlon, who is looking to try to get a community garden off the ground. Um, I, I just think that the, the, the amount of participation in the, of, from the residents of the north is, is really uh, terrific. And uh, thank you for continuing to, uh, to push us on the um, food market issue, um, it's absolutely long overdue. So thank you for uh, continuing your continued advocacy on that. Thank you too, sir. And I do apologize for not recognizing you being there. But I do remember seeing you and your words and just share with the council our tremendous. Again, I just want to let everyone know there is a lot of energy in the northern area. I should repeat, there is a lot of energy. And good wisdom tells us that Go ahead and capture it. You capture it. Capture part of the energy and have it work. The future is there, folks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I do want to remind council that during citizen communication, and I completely concur with your comments, Council Member I know that we are supposed to just address those to our staff as a council policy. Um, and Council Member Benson. Well, I wanted to thank Mr. Newsom for his uh, comments about our board meeting. I thought it was. Success also, we give a lot of people a lot of information. It's almost an information overload. We went about 30 minutes over and we still really didn't cover everything as thoroughly as I wanted to. I'll give a report about that later on. I would just point out that we do have, I think he's in the audience tonight, Mr. Stilato. He's trying to open up a uh, small grocery store in Delhi in the North area. And I'll comment about that later on, um, about what we can do to help that. Uh, come to fruition because we do need this grocery store for this thing and uh, it's what everybody wants up there and whether it's small or not uh, I hope we're going to be able to do what's necessary to uh, bring that grocery store into Commerce City. Thank you. Thank you Councilman Benson and I don't have him on the uh, roster for speaking right now so I'm sure we'll hear more about that a little bit later in the reports. Okay, seeing nothing else, we'll move on to the, uh, we're going to point to amend the agenda this evening. In view of the absence of two council members this evening, it is requested that uh, item 11 on tab 8 of the agenda regarding council policy number 2 be postponed to a future date. I would like to entertain a motion to amend the agenda by postponement of the item. Councilman Peter? So moved. Councilman Johnson? Wonderful. It has been moved and seconded to postpone item 11 regarding council policy number two to a future date. Is there any discussion? Councilman Bullock? Uh, yes, I was going to ask uh, who asked for this to be put on the council, I mean, on our, uh, our agenda? Who asked to have it put on the agenda? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... Uh, City Attorney Gaylor, could you assist us with that? The item is, it was placed on the agenda by staff because it was felt that it was appropriate for <coughs> City Council just to review your policy in regards to uh, Council Policy Number 2. And so it was just a discussion item, not an action item for you to consider. Thank you. I mean, uh, it comes to a time, timely manner, and I'm glad it's here, but I was kind of uh, curious to uh, how it got on the agenda. But uh, staff sees a lot of things that we don't see up here, so thank you, staff. You're beautiful people. <laughs> I would agree with you, Councilman Bullock. Okay, Councilman Benson. <laughs> I was going to ask the same question. It seems like there's things that surprise me just about every week about how they got on the agenda. Um, whose decision was it to take this off of the agenda? The um, I, I might first address the question. Um, as council knows, uh, we have a uh, committee, an agenda committee. Uh, Nanette Nealon. Todd Maker, I, and the member of the City Crooks Office sit on that committee. And what we do each week after a council meeting, meet and discuss what council was indicated an interest in in the previous night's meeting. And then we try to set an agenda that uh, is somewhat considerate of the time elements so that you're not here until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. That happened on one or so occasions. But we take that into account, and then we also take into account the requests of counsel that you've made uh, in open session. And then sometimes uh, an individual council member will bring to the committee's attention a problem area that we feel is appropriate for the whole council to consider. And in that way, then the agenda is set. So it's somewhat an informal process, but on the other hand, we try to take into account the concerns of the council and what you've uh, indicated, because after all, it is your agenda and your meeting. And that's the way we proceed. Usually those agenda setting meetings um, uh, try to set not only for the immediate uh, forthcoming meeting, but for a month or even six weeks in advance as to what it looks like should be handled. That includes public hearing process, includes ordinances, resolutions, etc. Well, whose decision was it to take it off of the agenda? It was a request to take it off of the agenda, Councilman Vincent. Um, I spoke with the City Attorney Gaylor earlier and asked him about the evaluation that we were supposed to have this evening because, of course, with Councilman McEldowney being out this evening, there was no way for us to move forward with that. And I also suggested that we could ask Council if they were okay with moving the Council policy discussion to another evening because we're missing two Council people. So it was merely a suggestion, and that's why I'm asking if the rest of the council, you know, I'm not making the decision, I was merely posing the question to the council, is what it was. So I claim responsibility for that. Yeah. We're asking the question, yeah. And I'm going to make suggestions to the city attorney about this, so I just want to know yeah. you made that suggestion. I just asked if it would be okay, and I'm asking the council now if it would be okay. I'm certainly not making any decisions. It's like everyone's, yeah, yeah. I might add. For everybody's benefit, in all fairness to Mayor Pro Tem, uh, she has plans to depart early tomorrow morning from the trip, and she had originally asked to be excused this evening, and uh, Council approved that ex excused absence, if you would call it the last meeting. And then when the Mayor uh, received his injury, and we discussed it with the Mayor Pro Tem that, uh, if she's not there, then we have to go through a process of having the council elect an acting chair. And the city clerk advised me there was a problem with uh, neither the mayor nor the mayor pro tem being present with handling the voting process and all things considered. Uh, the mayor pro tem then said, hey, I'll be there this evening, but on one condition, that you 
try to streamline the agenda so that I'm not there until the wee hours of the morning. So that also was a factor in requesting the council to take that item off the agenda. I appreciate that explanation because sometimes we don't get that kind of an explanation. Things just happen and I kind of wonder why sometimes. And I'm glad to have that kind of an explanation. It certainly makes sense to me. Thank you. Well, I think it's totally legitimate that you would ask that question and I appreciate you giving us an immediate opportunity to explain why I might have done that. So thank you for asking. Councilman Bullock. Uh, I just want to inform the city clerk and anybody otherwise that I was mayor pro tem for two years and I do know how to handle the voting on the, up here and everything. But as a council, we're going to discuss this tonight in council policy. Uh, we're going to put together a policy so if the mayor and the uh, mayor pro tem are gone, it'll be a rotation basis on how council members are selected to be uh, chair of the meeting from now on so we won't run into this problem again. Mr. Bullock, thank you very much for that. Um, I was here when you were on before and, and do recall that yes, you do know how to run a meeting. The problem isn't that. What the, the challenge is, is that we only we cannot create voting boards in our system on the fly. We have to have an advance notice so that we can send the any uh, roll call vote items to a board and we need to know that prior to the meeting. We only have, two, at this time, we only have two boards created. One is when the mayor is seated and the second is when the mayor pro tem is seated. If there was a vote at council during the council meeting about who was going to chair the meeting at, when the meeting began, we don't have the opportunity to adjust the electronics or the technology, the technology piece of it to a company council. So your request to speak buttons would not work, nor would we would be going, you know, calling for a voice, calling for a roll call voice, vote, excuse me. So that's the challenges we face electronically um, with a moving board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, it makes sense now that um, we're a little bit behind the technology. And honestly, it's my pleasure to come in. I mean, if I need it, I'm going to be here if I possibly can. I mean, there will be times when I can't be, obviously, but if I can possibly humanly be here, I will be here. So I am committed to doing my job, and I will do what it takes. So I appreciate everybody um, being willing to work with me and then making a little adjustment in the um, agenda this evening. Uh, Councilman Benson. Yes, uh, Mr. Gaylor, um, I know the... Uh, the charter spells out certain uh, obligations for the mayor says the mayor pro tem takes over in the mayor's absence. Would uh, I, I agree with Mr. Bullock's suggestion? I'm just wondering if that would be in, con in conflict with our charter at all. If we can do this by uh, policy or resolution, I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, if it's known for Ms. Taylor sometime in advance, so maybe she can make the necessary changes. But uh, there, there are going to be times. Well, maybe that's going to happen, but it hasn't happened since I've been on the council. But there are going to be times when that's going to happen that we need to deal with that up front before it does happen. Is that, is that going to be a conflict with our charter? Let me state what the charter says. The charter simply says, in the absence of the mayor and the mayor pro tem, then the council, by vote of the council, will uh, elect an acting chair. So what in, in that regard, you can't choose somebody in advance because you elect the chair, the acting chair, at a council meeting when the mayor and the mayor pro tem are absent. So I'm not sure what we would have in mind about trying to streamline the process because uh, you can't choose somebody in advance, like for example, seniority or uh, so it has to be someone at large or, or, or some criteria like that because the charter says you elect the person. And, well, and that, that's what's in the charter, and that, that's what we have to go with. Right, that's what you do. But if we were absent, uh, Ms. Snyder, tonight, we would have to elect. We would elect. We'd have to deal with right. the electronics. Someone, uh, what we, this has happened on occasion. I don't remember exactly when, but. Uh, I recall uh, when the meeting was 
first uh, convened that uh, I, as city attorney, uh, called for nominations uh, because at that point you didn't have anybody to chair the meeting. So I called for nominations. The nomination was made and you elected one of your members then to serve as chair. And that's the way we did it that evening. And I remember that it was, uh, happened to be Scott Jacobs that she chose that evening, if any of you recall that particular evening. But uh, the process is spelled out in the charter, so I'm not sure what we could add or subtract from that process. Frankly, it's only happened, uh, I recall, one time in the last several years. I can't remember a single time except yeah. other than that one time that you're mentioning in the eight years that this happened, so it doesn't so, happen too often. You know, if that's in our charter, that's our constitution. We, we can't violate that. I agree with you. I agree with you, Mr. Benson. Thank you. I also have another question about we also cancel the executive session. Uh, whose request was that done? I have a uh, proposal that I wanted to make to the city council, to all of you. Right. And uh, I felt that with, at that time, when the decision was first apparently made, council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Snyder was going to be absent. The mayor was going to be absent. Councilman McAdamie was going to be absent. And I really wanted to make my proposal to, to at least uh, more than six of you. And so it was at my request then the city uh, acting city manager, Neilan, agreed then that it would probably be just as well to have my evaluation next week. We've already postponed it a couple times, but um, that was really in conjunction with my request that I'd be able to have my evaluation and my proposal considered by city council, at least more than just what appeared to be coming this evening. Well, you know, I, I can understand the reasons behind it, but isn't it the province, the sole province of the council to make that kind of a decision? You're right, that is true. But I guess I just don't understand how these things happen. This is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. Well, I mean, we're not supposed to usurp the authority of the staff. And I don't want the staff trying to take over our job as the council either. So I just, I, I would just like to see people be a little more careful about going along with our uh, charter. And uh, well, maybe I have a division of responsibility. Maybe I could take some responsibility. My, my, the choice was is to have everybody come at 530 and say, we're not doing this. I did call Dominic um, because he was going to be the uh, uh, moderator for the uh, for my evaluation. Uh, however, I, I could have, in the alternative, requested that when the council convened at 5:30, that we con that we continue the whole thing until 6:30. Uh, we follow, but to save you all coming in. That was a decision made on the spot. So if I was wrong in that regard, I, I do apologize. And, and I am aware of that concern and that practice, and we'll certainly try to avoid that in the future. But we do need to take into account the city council's uh, convenience and uh, your situation. Right. You came in an hour early for nothing. Well, then, in order to make this uh, constitutional, so to speak, I will move that we uh, change the executive session to next week. Second motion. That would certainly be in order as appropriate uh, in order to make it a matter of record. Otherwise, the agenda, the agenda committee would have just put it on the agenda. But this is probably a better process because anytime you continue something, uh, that's already on the agenda. The better process is that the city council make it a matter of record for the minute. So that motion certainly is in order. Uh, motion. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you. What is the motion on we, the floor? Thank you, uh, uh, Laura. I appreciate that. We do have a motion second on the floor to um, move remove um, item 11, tab 8. Oh, so if we could just get through that one first and then Good. go ahead and move on to the next one, would that be appropriate? That um, Okay, great. So, Dominic, did you have anything before that? Okay. 
So I have a motion and a second to amend the um, agenda regarding tab eight, policy number two, be postponed to a future date. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. And now we have a motion by Councilman Vincent and a second by Councilwoman Teeter. Can I get the, that motion again, please? It was a motion to um, move the executive session schedule for tonight to next Monday night. Thank you. Okay. So it's been moved the executive to move that executive session with uh, City Attorney Gaylor to next Monday night. Madam Mayor, may I return just a quick. Oh, sure, of course. I'm sorry. Um, I, I know that the, the process does seem tedious, but I do agree with the person that those formalities should be recognized and followed, so it's good that we're doing this. I agree with you, Councilman Marino, and I appreciate Councilman Vincent bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And all those opposed? Okay, motion passes next Monday night. Okay, having gotten past that, Tonight, the City Council would like to give recognition to the Boys and Girls Club at Kearney Middle School in Commerce City. Would Acting City Manager Net Nealon please invite the staff member to come forward and present the certificate? Thank you. Another good news moment. And I'd like to have Ms. Rain Cordera, who's been active on the, the project of Boys and Girls Club, come up and talk to Council. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Good evening, um, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the Council. Um, in recognition to the Boys and Girls Club at Carney Middle School in Commerce City, the Boys and Girls Club at Carney Middle School has achieved a number of highlights while serving the most at-risk children in Commerce City. As their mission suggests, the Boys and Girls Club works to inspire and enable young people, especially those from disadvantaged circumstances, to realize their full potential as productive, responsible, and caring citizens. Among the highlights for the previous year of service, the programs achieved the following. The Boys and Girls Club at Carney Middle School in Commerce City has seen an increase of 88% in service hours, 30% increase in total membership. A Commerce City uh, Boys and Girls Club participant won first place in the Southwest Regional Digital Arts Festival for the entry, The Nature of Love in Graphic Design. Two of the 18 image makers photography contests and one of the fine art exhibit city winners were from the Commerce City Club. 49 Commerce City participants received entry into the Gates Camp this past summer where they participated in activities such as hiking, canoeing, rock climbing, archery, hands-on environmental games and other outdoor activities. 76 Commerce City youth took part in the What Moves You Play 60 program where they collectively participated in 478 hours of physical activity. And lastly, uh, Carney Middle School club members won in several categories such as math, spelling, geography, trivia, and science at the 2010 Boys and Girls Club State Education Day event. At this point, I would like to invite to the microphone Jason Martinez, who is the Commerce City Branch Director for the Boys and Girls Club, and uh, some young men and women that came with that. Okay, with the council, I'd like to go and out at the podium to present the search to our certificate. Okay, that'd be great. We'd like to come down and join us and tell us. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jason Martinez. I'm the branch director at the Commerce City Boys and Girls Club at Kearney Middle School. And uh, on behalf of the staff and members there, I would like to thank the Commerce City and City Council for recognizing our services to youth in Commerce City. Um, it's this recognition that shows your dedication to our, our shows your dedication and ongoing support of youth services within Commerce City. So I very much appreciate that. Um, we'd also like to mention that you know our hopes are one day to still expand and provide further services to a larger portion of Commerce City. Um, but at this point, we're still doing well over there at Kearney Middle School. As Ms. mentioned earlier, the highlights that we're given is just a small fraction of all the great things that are happening on a daily basis. So at any time, I'd like to invite anyone in this room to come by for a tour. If you know any kids who would like to become members, come by, we'll give them that tour, and answer any questions that you may have. So again, thank you very much for this recognition.
Councilman Bernardo? Again, I just want to uh, applaud the great work that the Boys and Girls Club is doing. Uh, I had a chance uh, when I was working as a legislative aide at the state capitol to go to a Boys and Girls Club reception uh, from kids all, with kids all around the state and uh, didn't know, but uh, apparently uh, Senator, Senator, one of our senators, Michael Bennett, was also a part of the Boys and Girls Club, so I think it just shows how far you can go with, uh, with their help. And it's a great program, and uh, I really value the the work they do in our community. Thank you. Councilman Vincent? Yes, I want to echo what Mr. Moreno just said. I think the Boys and Girls Club is a, uh, a great organization. Uh, when I was growing up, it wasn't present when I was growing up, but I remember uh, going to the Boys and it was called the Boys Club back then. Mm -hmm. Now it's become more politically correct. It's the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, this was back in the 50s. We didn't have girls, but it was just the Boys Club back then. And I would ask, you know, the, the statement was made that uh, at some point you're going to need to move out of uh, caring uh, to get more space. Uh, when do you think that will occur? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I just want to point out, you know, we did try two years ago to build a standalone boys and girls club, and I was shot down four to one. And I just I know a lot of talk was uh, I had at that time about the fact that this money is available from other sources. And here we are two years later, we don't have any money from any other source that's being directed towards building a standalone boys and girls club. And uh, I guess that would be something I might bring up later on because I still think that that admissions tax, the visitors tax, is probably a good way to finance it. Um, but we're not anywhere. We have about two million dollars in the bank right now to build a boys and girls club at that tax. As it is, we have nothing, no plans for the future for a boys and girls club, no money, nothing. So, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councilman Vincent. I'm asking City Manager Newman. Sorry to uh, to bring you in on this, but actually, we've had a few meetings with the committee, and I'm a part of that committee. And um, there have been several members that have come, and his, I believe, is a part of that as well. That we have actually been having ongoing conversations about the future of the Boys and Girls Club and what we're going to do. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just providing a brief update on where we're at with that. I think it'd be appropriate to have this come up, okay. uh, maybe give a quick overview. But I think it's intended to have it as a study session item for council. I was under the understanding it would be, but since Councilman Vincent brought it up, I thought maybe we could just give a short synopsis of where we're at. That would be great. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yes. Good evening, Council. Again, um, yes, there has been a group of stakeholders that has been meeting since uh, the city was awarded the um, the appropriation mm -hmm. back in January and that there has been some forward movement and I have requested an agenda item which will come at the end of October. And uh, Councilman Benson, you'll get, I think your questions are answered in terms of what we think is the ideal um, road to follow in terms of uh, having an expansion for the Boys and Girls Club in the city. Thank you, Ms. And Councilman Vincent, I wanted you to know that we actually have been having those ongoing conversations and since I was one of the two members that was on that. Um, you know, I just didn't want you to think that it was dead because it actually is and it's very much alive and well and we have certainly been having those talks and those conversations. So there's actually some movement um, definitely going on. Uh, Councilman Vincent, did you have more to add? Yes. How much money? How much money? How much money do we have towards the building of standalone boys and girls club? I mean, just within 100,000, so to speak. Well, my understanding is we have a we have the appropriation of I think something like 160 thousand dollars. So that, that's what we had four years ago, really. And then we don't have that price. information at the presentation. Yes, we will. But that was obtained for us by Congressman Palmer about three or four years ago. So nothing's changed. I think that was requested at that time. Right. We we received it okay. right. in January. That, that was what I wanted to. Nothing's really changed. We have meetings and talk going on, but nothing has really happened. We have no money. It's not going to happen until we get the money. And I don't know where we're going to get the money. I hope that maybe your synopsis will explain to me, at least, where we're going to get that money. So I hope it will. Thank you. Well, we look forward to your presentation, Ms. Thank right. you very much.
Okay, moving on to resolution 2010-44. There are two resolutions that were not included on the consent agenda because they require a separate voice vote. For the first resolution is 2010-44, a resolution approving conveyance of certain city-owned property of Brighton School District 27J for Turnberry Elementary School site. I will now ask City Attorney Gaylor to explain resolution 2010-44. In the way of background, uh, this particular site uh, was originally vacant land. It was part of a plat then was, that was approved as a, part of a subdivision by the city. And on that plat, uh, the ground was dedicated to Commerce City, the city of Commerce City. The intent was that part of that site would be school property, which would include playgrounds, and part of it would be for a park site for Commerce City. School was built, and 10 acres then have been set aside for a uh, playground area, and then another 10 acres then is set aside for city park area. So in accord with the agreement with the school district, the 10 acres that is to be used for playgrounds is to be owned by the school district, and this resolution then follows through with that intent and authorizes the conveyance to the school district of the 10 acres to be used for the playground in conjunction with the the school building site. And 10 acres will be reserved then for the city of Commerce City to be used as a park site, but the two sites are adjacent to each other, playground and park site, so it makes for a nice amenity, totally 20 acres. And so a passage of this resolution will accomplish that goal. Thank you, sir. Okay, I will now entertain a motion at this time. Councilwoman Ms. Heater. Uh, yes, move to approve resolution 2010-44. Councilman Johnson? Second motion. Thank you, sir. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2010-44. Will the city attorney please read the title? Title reads resolution 2010-44, conveyance of city-owned property to school district 27J for Turnberry Elementary School site. Thank you, sir. May I have a voice vote, please? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those against? Motion passes to 2010-44. Our next resolution is 2010-54, a resolution approving a conservation easement and authorizing conveyance of the easement to Adams County. I will now entertain a motion at this time. Council is here. Yes, move to approve resolution 2010-54. Councilman Johnson. Second motion. It has been moved and seconded to approve resolution 2010-54. Is there any discussion by council? Councilman Moreno? Uh, Mr. Ricker, I just had a question about, um, in our packet, uh, it showed that the, is it the easement that is going to be approximately 100 acres? Is that the the total of the easements, or is that? Mayor for County Councilman Moreno, yes, the easement will be a total of about 100 acres, which is the amount that we're getting from the shells for the donation. Okay, and all of that 100 acres will be used, uh, it was slated for use as a regional stormwater facility? That is correct. Um, some portion of it may be a realignment of Peoria Street once the road is uh, once the reservoir is being built, but primarily the purpose is for some retention. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Bullock? Uh, Mr. Akers, don't sit down. Uh, can you uh, also give a little brief update after that conservation easement is in full effect uh, for stormwater drainage? What are some of the benefits to the city uh, residents from that? In addition to the regional stormwater retention, the site will also act as open space. It's a part of and adjacent to the first street greenway that's proposed in trail, which will link to the uh, perimeter trail within the, around the refuge. Um, we are, we get preserved some ability to have um, passive use of that site. Uh, a couple of probably uh, picnic shelters or benches, but not really in the active site because at any time it could be um, underwater. 
Thank you. Okay, if there's no more discussion, will the city attorney please read the title? Title reads Resolution 2010-54, Resolution Approving a Conservation Easement and Authorizing Conveyance of Easement to Adams County. Thank you, sir. May I have a voice vote, please? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Next, we're on to ordinances on first reading, and the first one is Ordinance 1817. So there are two ordinances on first reading. The first is 1817, an ordinance amending the 2010 budget by the U.S. Department of Justice, COPS Technology Grant, in the amount of $110,000. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address council on this ordinance? Is there anyone on council who wishes to? Any questions? No? Okay. If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve, or I'm sorry, to introduce Ordinance 1817 by council as seated. Council Member Uh Move to introduce Ordinance 1817 with Council Thank you, sir. Council Member Second motion. It has been moved and seconded to approve Ordinance 1817 on first reading. Will the City Attorney please read the title? Title reads, An Ordinance Amending the 2010 Budget of the City of Commerce City, Colorado by the recognition of the U.S. Department of Justice Cox Technology Grant in the amount of $110,000 to fund the purchase of 38 digital trunked radios and two interoperable communications gateways to coordinate emergency services personnel during emergency responses and the authorization of the expenditure thereof. Thank you, sir. I'll now have a roll call vote, please. Thank you. We have seven yeses and zero no's. Motion passes. The next is Ordinance 1839, an ordinance amending the cable television system franchise agreement between the City of Commerce City and Comcast Colorado LLC to extend the terms of the franchise. Will Acting City Manager Manette Neeland please explain Ordinance 1839. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, this is a, one of the activities that I'd like to give accolades to Greg Graham, who's at our city attorney's office, and John Howard. They participate in the Greater Metro Transportation uh, Telecommunication Consortium. And that consortium is looking into the renewal of the Comcast uh, franchises all across the metro area and even statewide. Um, the legal um, support of that consortium is by a, a former mayor, Mayor Ken Feldman, who used to be the primary mayor of Arvada. And for the past year, there's been discussions uh, with Comcast to look at what would the franchise uh, renegotiations look like. And we've been acting as a collaborative group with all the other municipalities within the metro area. And with that, they have been working diligently with Comcast and come to a recommendation that extend uh, cities franchise agreements for three more years and that the city of Aurora and the city and county of Denver work on several negotiations. I'd also like to highlight in this extensions to 2013, as we had discussion last week of talking about the funding for Channel 8 and where was the funds coming from for all the capital infrastructure so we can live stream Channel 8. And this is where the funding, what we call PEG, public education and government funding, as money comes from through this franchise agreement. So today, the council is being asked to just continue it, allow negotiations as the greater we, and then um, staff will be coming back in about three years, if not sooner, with something that's from a metro perspective on this, and still preserves Commerce City's interest. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Edel? Uh, thanks for the explanation, Ms. Neal. I, I did have a question because I wasn't in, entirely uh, clear on. By franchise, do we mean that we use uh, Comcast broadband service exclusively as Commerce City? Like for our, for our, I was just unsure what we meant by franchise. 
practical matter, that, that is correct. Uh, the franchise agreement is not an exclusive, but it works that way because Comcast is the uh, is the uh, entity that provides the service, and we have that franchise with them. Uh, following up what uh, Acting City Manager Leland said, uh, the franchise agreement, as you would surmise, is in place. And what we're doing is extending the franchise that we have for three years in order that we can uh, work along with the other cities in conjunction with the consortium to make the franchises expire somewhat simultaneously and then we'll have a franchise agreement in place in three years that corresponds with what the other cities are doing so that each one doesn't have a separate independently negotiated franchise agreement. So I guess my question is, that, uh, for example, when, when we broadcast our live meetings on Channel 8, uh, they are available to Comcast customers, however, not available to, for example, people in our city that have direct TV. Um, would, is that something that we can negotiate with Comcast, or is that something that's just kind of included in the package? Or? Um, in the past, the franchise agreement is only pertaining to Comcast, though we're putting a list of issues together, and that's something we'll explore and see what the legal ramifications of that are. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Benson. Uh, it's probably a matter of federal law that no franchise can be exclusive. It has to be, uh, so but it's a matter of, of law, it's not exclusive, as a matter of fact, it is. It's right, and it also provides that in our charter. Okay. And yeah, they would have to uh, rent uh, the five objects network. The company has to be required to do that, but it's just so expensive to do that. It's not have, so as a matter of fact, it is exclusive. But, um, <coughs> Was any research done into, uh, you know, we have a metro area here, we have Colorado Springs and Pueblo. Uh, I have found that there are different programming packages available in some other cities. Have we done any research into what those programming packages are to be assured that right now, before we renew, we're getting all the channels that say people in Colorado Springs are getting, uh, people in that, I know, with regard to ESPNU, the Springs had it about a year before we had it. We finally got it first part of July. The, the programming part is you had a, a, a basic service and then extended services, and as each city originally negotiated their franchise agreement, some of that was discussed. And that is the reason if you're the first out of the gate, you may come up with an idea and, and they not have benefit of other ideas, and that's why we're all trying to get on the same schedule. So you negotiate in a collective we, instead of us going out negotiating. Then the next entity negotiates something to go, I wish we thought of that. And then the next one comes out. So we're trying to get a collective we in this discussion, and Comcast is open to that. Well, I can understand why we're um, making this just a three-year contract, so we have the benefit of the Denver and Aurora discussions. But I think that there are some things we can probably do now, at least raise the issue with them. There are things that maybe the Dish Network or uh, DirecTV have that Comcast doesn't. I don't think there are very many. I have Comcast. I think it's better than the Dishes. But uh, I just I just hate to just say, okay, we're going to blanket and blanket matter renew this without looking into what the channel lineup is. We have the ability to negotiate about what we're getting here based on what other cities in the state have. And we shouldn't be getting anything uh, less. Sometimes they'll tell you, well, that's, we're building out our fiber optic network. Um, it's going to be six months, and then it might take a year. But I just think, shouldn't we have some kind of discussion with them before we just sign off on this? And say, this All is we're not negotiating right now. All we're asking is to move forward and extend our current franchise agreement so that we can have these types of conversations. Otherwise, the city is at by themselves, the big great grand on our benefit, would be negotiating with Comcast to get the franchise agreement done by November, uh, early November. And we do not feel like we have adequate information to 
to do the best job for the residents of the city of Commerce City in the negotiations. And so this extends our current franchise agreement just another three years. When you say we're not negotiating right now, why aren't we negotiating right now? Well, as you well know, once you open the door to negotiations, that's a two-way street. So anything we're asking for, they're in a position to be asking for. Well, I know, and, you know unless, you, unless you make a formal offer. And, uh, so if you have a contract law for us, the discussions can be had with people without actually negotiating or making offers and counter offers. You know, here's what we're thinking about, can you do this for us? Without actually saying we're not going to do it unless you do this. I'm not giving anybody an ultimatum. I just take the see us to say, okay, we're going to renew this for three years because we want to pay back on what Aurora and Denver are doing three years down the road. Why should we just automatically renew this for three years? Well, the other option is if we don't renew it, then uh, we're not in a very good negotiating position either. We well, you know, what would it cost Comcast if uh, they cut off everybody in Comcast and Congress? They're not about to do that. Cost them a lot of money. They've got a big infrastructure built up in the city and fiber, fiber optics network. They're not about to say, well, we don't have an agreement in place. We're just going to cut everybody off and you guys can go with the dishes. You know, this is an extremely competitive business. They want this business. I just don't see how it hurts us to raise some issues instead of just going out and saying, well, fine, we'll just extend our contract for three years with no discussion, no negotiation about anything. Uh, I, I just, I don't like that. Because there are things that we can do. And the only way that we can put pressure on them is in this way. No individual calling up and saying, I want you to get this programming. That doesn't have any effect at all on the dishes or Comcast until they get maybe 10,000 uh, requests for something. Because this is the city is the one that negotiates for us. Everybody that's a Comcast or subscribe. Well, that, except for the fact that, as you, you may know, we're a member of the consortium. And uh, as a member of that consortium, uh, we have the right uh, to have the attorney who is Ken Feldman, the expert in this entire area uh, represent us with uh, with regard to any franchise as he does with any other city who is a member of the consortium so the school of thought is is that rather than us go out there and start trying to negotiate anything on our own that we keep it as a a unit and as a team and use our best expertise uh, to negotiate in tandem with the other cities. Now others, some of the cities do not have the same expiration date as we do. And that's why this three year date was chosen because that makes it correspond with the expiration date of the other cities. So then we're all in the same package. Now I appreciate what you're what you're saying and, and where you're you're going with this discussion. However, when our franchise agreement, what it basically does is tells Comcast that in order for them to use our rights of way, they have to pay certain things. Now, if the franchise agreement were to expire, it's not to say that they couldn't continue to provide the service, but they would be in the position of not being able to use our right-of-way, and then we're in the, in the difficult situation that they would probably, in order to keep their service going, have to condemn and start um, uh, eminent domain proceedings in order to use our, 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 our right-of-way, because we're not going to give permission that right away. So you can see that kind of entanglement that we would be in. <laughs> so, so we gave them some kind of an ultimatum. That's not what I was saying. Yeah, right. And I appreciate that, that we're not giving them the ultimatum. But the problem is, is when we open the door and say we want to negotiate on our own, then what we are involved with doing is telling the consortium, we're going to press ahead at this time 
And the consortium is saying, asking us, hey, let's do this as a group. That way we can assert more authority, have a stronger negotiating position if we're all together. What cities make up the consortium? As I said, most of the metro area, as a matter of fact, because of the negotiating uh, respect that has been received, it's, it's looking at extending past the greater metro area and areas in the western slope and southern Colorado want to be part of this. But I don't have all the names right at this point. Well, you know, I, I, so I know Ken Feldman, and I know what his experience is in uh, cable TV, uh, certainly in respect for his legal ability. Uh, has anybody asked him about what I'm talking about? Yes, we have, we've had, in fact, we had a meeting. I was present uh, at, at least one meeting, and, I, and you were present at other meetings involving Ken Hellman, and he's been actively involved in these discussions. So he's fully aware of what we're talking about, and in fact, it's at the consortium's request that we all join together rather than trying to negotiate anything independently. Somebody specifically asked him a question. Yeah, if there are channels that uh, maybe uh, Littleton or Colorado Springs is getting, and we're not getting the cover city, wouldn't it be to advantage to try to at least uh, get a couple of channels to add into our channel lineup in this extension? Does anybody ask him that specific question? The discussions happened at the Greater Metro, but to say, have, have I personally asked that question to Ken Feldman? No. I, I think there's opportunities that will open up in the coming years that we could see benefit from, and it may not take the franchise agreement to get some of the behavior to change. Okay, I have that you're finished, Councilman Benson. Um, I have right before you finish. Okay, Councilman Johnson. Yeah, Okay, and Council Moreno, you want, discussion? you want discussion? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think Mr. Benson brings up a good point, but I do agree with staff. Um, it's a really smart move to align ourselves with the two largest cities in the metro area, because that way you're you're more inclined, you're more likely to get concession, concessions that way. Um, I think it's no different than when we form like the North Metro Transit Alliance. You get more when you bring a, a strong team to the table. Uh, so I, 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 I'm in complete agreement with this, and I, I think it's a smart move. Thank you, sir. Um, Happy City Manager Neelan, I was under the impression also from some discussions that I've heard is, is that the, the consortium is looking to certainly go beyond the borders of who's currently involved, and that there are a lot of outer line areas that are interested in getting in on it as a part of it. So, uh, and then you just mentioned that, so what I was hearing about that is correct then. Yes, okay, great, wonderful. Okay, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address council on this ordinance? Seeing none, okay. I have a motion from Councilman Johnson. Do I have a second? Councilman Teeter? Second motion. It has been moved and seconded to approve ordinance 1839. Felicity Turney, please read the title. Title of the ordinance reads, Ordinance 1839, an ordinance amending the cable television system franchise agreement between the City of Commerce City and Comcast of Colorado, number 9, LLC, to extend the term of the franchise. Thank you, sir. I'll have a roll call vote, please. Um, again, I'd like to call Ms. Rian Cordero, our Intergovernmental Relations 
manager who's been working diligently on this issue and uh, came to introduce our speakers. Good evening, members of council. Um, at the uh, council meeting on August 2nd, I believe, council directed staff to um, invite members of the local boards and commissions to present on the estimated impact should uh, one or all three of the uh, three ballot measures, uh, um, Amendment 60 and 61, and Proposition 101, pass. What would be the what would those impacts? look like on their specific boards. So I would like to invite right now uh, Superintendent Rod Blunt from Brighton School District 27J uh, to give us their perspective. Good evening, sir. Thank you for being here today. <coughs> Madam Mayor Pernan and members of council, thank you so much. I very much appreciate the opportunity on behalf of School District 27J to give you factual information with regards to each one of these entities and the potential impacts that they would have on School District 27J. And as you are aware, and, and 27J is, has always been appreciative of the partnership that we have had with Commerce City, and for a number of years, the largest portion of our growth. And as you know, the 27J remains the fastest growing school district within the state of Colorado. As we begin to take a look at this, I decided not to put the, uh, the PowerPoint together, but more than the to have a conversation and provide you with the factual information that's been provided by my staff uh, so that you're aware of the impact to our school district. 101 has an impact of $2.7 million each fiscal year for 27J, based on a $103 million annual budget. Over the course of the last few years, we have experienced a reduction in our specific ownership taxes anyway, according to uh, payments and those types of things received from the county. Approximately three years ago, the, the general fund budget for specific ownership tax in 27J, ladies and gentlemen, was $3.2 million. It is now about $2.9 million. It will be reduced to about $2.7 million should, should Proposition 101 be successful. This is in addition to a 6.5% cut that we received last year into our general fund. Now, Amendment 60 would have the greatest impact upon 27J, an estimated annual negative impact of $10.6 million. And we've amortized this over the course of, of the, the 20 year, excuse me, the 10 year phasing period, but about uh, a little over 10% of our budget each year. The other piece that we need to look at are the mitigating factors that come along with this. The fact that we would be required each and every year to come back, or in each and every instance, to reduce up the mill levy based on paying off certain pieces. 27J currently has 15,000 students. Approximately 8,000 students ride a bus each and every day. The average bus is costing us about $90,000. So, Without having the availability of the general fund to be able to write a check for those, we do lease payments. So as we go through and we add buses to our fleet, each time that we reduce the debt that we incur on a lease payment, we would have to go back and, and reduce then our general fund allocation as well. So as we begin to look at the life cycle of, of this uh, uh, proposed amendment, the impact upon 27J would be an annual revenue loss currently projected at $10.6 million each and every year. And then we move on to Amendment 61. Now please remember that 27J is the fastest growing school district in the state. It would take, based on the 10% assessed value limitation that, we, that would be put into place if this was passed, because the assessed value limitation right now is 25%. For 27J, our school district, the fastest growing school district in the state, to get down to the 10% margin would take 27J 13 years. We would have a capping on our assessed value of uh, debt capacity of 71 million. We're currently at 254 million because of our growth. Please remember that in, in the year 2000, 27J had 5,246 kids in it. Here we are 120 months later, and we are knocking on the door of 15,000 kids today. Now let's look at the future of the path of, there's a passage of Amendment 61. It would take us 10 years, according to our finance department, to get to that 10% limit. 
during this same time period, based on an independent audit of our projected growth done by a firm out of Boulder, 27J in that 13 year time period would have 31,000 students. So uh, we would have no debt capacity during that time period. We would essentially double in size. So I, once again, I appreciate and I want to make sure I'm courteous and respectful of your time. But I want to make sure that you realize and, and that we provide you factual information of what the impacts of, of these three amendments would have on our school district. And with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions before I have uh, <coughs> another presentation. Councilman Benson? Yes, thanks, Dr. Vaughn, for those numbers. Uh, I want to ask you a question about, say, bus leases. Uh, the passage of these would affect the, the district's ability to pay those leases, wouldn't it? Yes, because once the leases were, the debt was reduced, we would have to then reduce the millage and then go back just to, we'd have to go back to the voters just to buy more buses to transport kids. And on the bill that we overrides, which we've got a chart up here, you'd have to go back to 92 levels. Yes. I okay, guess. So, although we don't get very much in Bell we probably get less than any other metro district down there. Yes. So you get 55 million a year. Uh, 5,500, I mean. Yeah, we get $55 a year compared 55 to some of our neighborhoods. Compared to some of our neighborhoods. That's our 6871. Yes. Oh, you see, that's something that. Uh, I've heard people make the argument, well, aren't these things unconstitutional? And the point is, if they pass, if 6061 pass, they will be the Constitution. That's true. And they say that any other constitutional provision that's in conflict with them is superseded. However, there's a provision in the U.S. Constitution that you can't do anything that's going to impair the ability to enforce a contract. And that's what I'm thinking somebody's going to raise um, after these passed. Because as you know, either the state senate, the state house, or the governor have the ability to send questions to the Colorado Supreme Court, which they have to answer. And I'm sure that that's going to be one of those questions. I don't know how that's going to come out, but it seems to me like that's a constitutional issue that's going to have to be considered because it's going to impair the ability of any public entity to pay back its existing uh, bond structure. Well, and sir, you bring up a good point because I, I believe that that question and many others will be forwarded immediately after the, uh, the election, depending on that outcome. But that's also part of the reason that we decided to place a question on the ballot as well. Uh, not knowing that potential outcome and was it conflicting with any one of these amendments put on the, the ballot, uh, we decided that uh, I believe those questions will be asked by reasonable people and, and they'll receive a reasonable reply and, and uh, uh, we will move forward. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Carson? Uh, thank you, Dr. Blum, for coming to give us an honor. Out there. I always feel wrong. Um, <clears throat> you know, out here talking to citizens, uh, one of the number one things that I hear is the state will pass the back. Um, I don't know uh, um, any way to explain that better than have you explain. Um, you know, it, it's one of the things that we all know that uh, no child left behind is passed that was never funded. When there's no money, there's no money. And then the 23, uh, never fully done, correct? Yes. Uh, I don't understand that logic because uh, if the state has no money, I don't know how you go to them and get them to that point. And, and that's, a, that's a wonderful point and a, and a great question. Because we have the same issue with the race to the top dollars. The legislature put in the caveats with regards to race to the top, mandated certain things to happen in school, hoping that they would receive the funding. Well, if some funding didn't come through, we get the man's mandates are still here. And I think the, the piece with regards to the, the comments, because I've heard that in, in conversations that I've had across the state. If these pass, the economic impact will be felt far beyond the classroom. It'll be, it'll be felt in the state legislature with regards to coming back and looking at the revenue that they have to put into place. And while it is, is quite accurate that there is a piece of law that, is, that where the state has to backfill the dollars that cannot be raised locally, for the state of Colorado to do that would cost about $1.6 billion in order to make the 178 school districts in the state whole. Now, 
I, I don't know if you have, but I certainly have not read anything coming across my computer in a newsprint or on TV that would suggest that the state of Colorado has anywhere close to $1.6 billion in their resources. In fact, more than likely in the state of Colorado this year for public education, we will receive no less than a rescission on the edu jobs money. So the state has to fill it back. But if they don't have the resources, they're not going to be able to do so. Here's a good example of that. Over the course of, of my two decades in, in the, as a superintendent, the reimbursement rate for special education costs in the state of Colorado was never to dip below 80 cents on the dollar. It has been my experience over that 20 years that it has never exceeded 27 cents on the dollar. And I believe the same thing would occur here. Yeah, thank you. I think that that explanation might clear up. Uh, if you have other folks that uh, have that question, they're absolutely welcome to give me a call. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Carson. Uh, Councilman Bullock? Oh, my, my only remarks were that uh, when you look at the impact just on schools, and we're just talking about schools now, we have got the transportation, we haven't got the prisons, we haven't got the, any of the other, and we're talking about a $1.6 billion deficit. And then they have to backfill for roads, and they have, I mean, we know we don't have $1.6 billion, so how much more do, are we not going to have that's going to be lumped on to that? It's just, I mean, if you look at the cause and effect of this, these three uh, amendments, it, it's, it's devastating. They are actually undertaking amendments for this state that is going to drive um, not only education out, but uh, what business would want to come here after seeing that being passed in this state? Economic development would come to a standstill. Uh, and it's not like seniority um, uh, last uh, hire, first fire. Everybody's going to go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilman Bullock. Uh, Councilman Moreno. Thank you, Dr. Bullock, for coming in and presenting tonight. Uh, 27J is in a, in a unique and, and uh, to be frank, scary place. Uh, the rate of your funding is not keeping up with your population growth, with your students growing and the, the need for more schools and more resources. Uh, so, uh, you know, we all need to do our part as, as part of this community to make sure that our, every child in our community is well educated. Every child gets those opportunities. Uh, I think what's so lost sometimes in this discussion is how everything is, is connected. I think the biggest economic driver in our state is education, is that, that you need to have a, a well-educated workforce in order for businesses to want to come here. Uh, like uh, Councilman Bullock said, uh, businesses are going to look at our state and look, look at what we're doing to our public education system, and they're going to say, no, thank you. Because if we're not making the, the education of our, of our kids a priority, then, then what are we doing? Uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's all tied together. And, and, and economic development, uh, if you want to see more of it, then, then, then fund education. Uh, make sure that these children have uh, well-built schools and, and, and resources to go to to, to uh, be able to succeed. But you bring up a good point, sir, and the fact is, in the last six months, 27J is 159 out of 178 school districts when it comes to funding in the state of Colorado. And we have had an absolute commitment to our communities and to the elected officials within our communities to make sure that when you go out and look for a skilled workforce, that you look no further than your own backyard. The cumulative effect of these, if all three are passing, would be a reduction in 27J, who's currently 159 out of 178 school districts, would be an additional loss of 900 $50 per student. While we added 766 kids this school year, we anticipate adding over 835 kids next school year, and we anticipate adding over 1,000 kids to 27J in the fall of 2012. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Council of did you have anything else? Yeah, I just want to say we've got to be careful up here about um, urging a yes or no vote on any of these. I think what Dr. Wong has done is give us a lot of facts upon which we can rely on. That's, that's all it has to be done in one of these meetings. Uh, that said, um, where's the price of play in Texas in two weeks? I believe it's in Texas. Well, okay, you're going to get a name like that. When do you sell it? Thank you, Dr. Glenn, for taking your time to be here this evening and helping to educate us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. And I do think Council of Wisdom does bring up a very good point. We do all have to be reminded that we have to be careful as elected officials, and I'm sure um, City Attorney Taylor would back me up on that, that we just are really in a position to take information and we not make any public statements as to our personal support on the issue one way or the other. So even though I know we all have strong feelings, <laughs> as does, I hope, the majority of people in Colorado. But we do have to be careful. And again, I thank you, Dr. Blunt, for taking your time. Uh, Mr. Cordero will be next. I'm Mayor of the Town and members of Council. I would like to invite uh, John Fulbright with Adams County School District 14. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Albright. Uh, that would 
amend several aspects of property tax and it will do, reduce the amount of property taxes paid by individuals and businesses to school districts, counties, special districts, cities, and towns. As we look at the specific impact, uh, statewide impact on K-12 education in year one, this is going to be a $337 million impact in year one to K-12 education statewide. When fully implemented after at 10 years out, looking at a 1.5 $1.6 billion production. Currently, K-12 education represents 46% uh, of the state's budget, and if Amendment 60 is fully implemented, K-12 education will be 67% of the state budget. Uh, Amendment 61, if this were to pass, would ban the use of any kind of debt by the state of Colorado and greatly limit the amount of debt issued by local governments. In Colorado, borrowing supports most public infrastructure projects. Uh, the Bell Policy Center believes Colorado will be the only state in the nation to um, not have authority to issue debt if Amendment 61 passes. Most school districts borrow funds from the state to make payroll prior to property tax revenues arriving late in the school year. 85% uh, of school district budgets go to support people costs, as I'm sure the uh, the city is familiar as well. Um, we, we have a lot of folks on our payroll to provide services to residents, to students, etc. Uh, if Amendment 61 passes, Adams 14 may be unable to make payroll beginning in December, which would place a hardship on all employees in the district. Uh, the Legislative Council of the Colorado General Assembly states that borrowing restrictions will require that the state and local governments either raise fees, reduce construction, or reduce their programs and services. In Adams 14, uh, just want to close by telling you the collective impact of all three of these measures uh, will be a reduction of revenue of $11,369,884. And that equates to nearly 42% of the district's revenue, or $1,742 per student. Any questions for me? Yes, Councilman Vincent. Well, you know, I've heard from uh, Ken Delight, who's the uh, executive director of Colorado Association of School Boards, that, um, as you mentioned, um, school districts normally are about cash poor by January, February, March, because the uh, property tax money has come in. Yet. He's saying that at least uh, 10 school districts statewide are going to have to shut down until the end of March. Correct. Normally, I mean, the, the same property tax situation will prevail, but normally the school districts would get a loan from the state to tide them over for that three month period. 61 is going to prevent any borrowing by the school district, and it's going to, without a voter approval, which has to be next November, which can't happen. And it also prevents the state from owning any money, so they won't have any money. The schools are going to have to close for January, February, and March. So I guess maybe we'll have a new, if these things pass, we'll have a new type of school year where you go to school from April the 1st through November the 30th, so to speak, and you have your uh, vacation in the wintertime instead of in the summertime. And do you agree with that? Is that, what's, is that what you think is going to happen? That is what um, many school districts are projecting, is that it could, it could result in the school district really only being open for a handful of months a year. Do you think, uh, are you saying sometime around mid-December, you may not have enough money to pay your staff? Are you thinking that by the end of the year, you're going to have to close up uh, Adams 14? Is that well, that would certainly be the worst case scenario. Uh, you know, we predict that uh, we will be able to make do with some of our reserves. Uh, last year, we were able to mitigate some of the budget cuts by transferring some reserves into uh, into our general fund to make the budget look a little bit better for this year. But if we keep having to do that, we're going to end up in a scenario where we have uh, there's statewide restrictions on the amount of money that we have to keep in reserves versus what we use. So, so having the reserves that we those will quickly go away. And I'm thinking that our ten school districts that Kim Delay was talking about, um, they're mostly rural districts, I think, but those kids, they won't be able to go to school January, February, and March. And I think that's, that's not just the scary.
here, and I think that's reality. Correct. Based on what I've read about it. So, okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you for appearing. Thank you, Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Albright, for being here tonight. Um, you know, like Councilman Benson, Benson said, uh, a lot of these uh, might appear to people like doomsday scenarios, but they're actually real possibilities, and that's the scary part of it. Uh, I did have a question about um, how any one of these amendments or propositions would uh, have, a, if they would have a specific impact on um, the new Adam City High School and the bond that the voters approved in order to build that school. Uh, that's a good question. I think Dr. Blum explained that fairly well around how, um, as it become implemented, uh, we'll have to pay back the dollars plus reduce uh, expenditures based on the amount of interest paid, etc. So, um, as far as being able to continue to have Adam City High School, or whether or not that would turn over to be property of the state or some unintended consequence like that. Um, I don't think that would happen. I think what happens is uh, more directly it inhibits ability to accommodate future growth. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been in the situation of growing, uh, whereas in previous years we had some declining enrollment. But um, as the economy tends to decline, our enrollment numbers in the fourth part of Commerce City uh, tend to go up. And so we've seen pretty large increases in the world in the last few years. And so what that trend continues, uh, the economy doesn't turn back around, and as our schools start to be smaller than capacity and needing renovations and repairs, then we would be limited in our ability to go forward with any measures to finance into that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Captain Bullock. Uh, something Mr. Benson just said struck me, and I was uh, I, I was trying to wrap my head around the uh, math of it. But um, he said that Kimberly was said that school districts would have to wait on the property tax until it's collected. But they always do. But they got long for the same. Now, if the property tax goes down the money that they would be waiting on would be decreasing also. Is this correct? So if you're looking at this the way I was just looking at it, not only would 10 school districts have to close, after the second year there would probably be 20 school districts to close because that funding that they would be waiting on until April to start school wouldn't be there then and they would be getting decreased funding anyway. So, I mean, it would look like we would have a really the school years all around the state, and sooner or later it's going to hit our school district. You know, I was, I'm looking at it the way I figured it out would be in year three, our school district would be one of the school districts that would have uh, a new calendar that would start probably uh, March to June, take a break, and then August, until uh, November and then take a break again because of, of reduced funding and lack of teachers and facilities because we do have an aging school district. I think, I think it's hard to answer exactly what the impact is going to be as far as how you would modify a school calendar or how you might um, uh, change your staffing levels, etc. Uh, part of what we're dealing with is requirements to make certain amounts of days in the school year under the state, um, certain amounts of hours for students to be in school. And so, you know, if these should pass, we'll have to have a lot of work to do to start projecting and reconciling what those things will look like in the future. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. You know, as somebody who uh, sometimes at the school, so I'm not sure that the public out here understands the budget cuts school districts across the state have the cuts that they have done with their staff, their program. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything left to cut unless we're, we're now talking about 60 students per classroom. Um, I honestly, I don't know, and I'm sure you guys don't. How we're going to go forward if we have 
That's in PDF. Yeah. Page. On the very top of the, the arrow. So the first item is taking a look at what the impacts of all these collective um, ballot issues have on Adams County going up four years. So at the beginning um, in 2011, $25.6 million dollars in impact right, right at the beginning of 2011. Um, slight increase in 2012, 2013, and 2014 up to $33.2 million. Dollars. Um, Adams County receives a significant amount of money from specific ownership tax. We've also had the ability to retain revenues um, via the voters in the past, and that has allowed us to, to keep money to pay for the services that we provide in Adams County. So there's a substantial impact right away in the beginning um, for Adams County revenues. The next slide, you hit that arrow. Um, jobs impacted by the initiative, what we did is we took those dollar amounts and figured out, well, how many jobs would that equate? And it might not be direct Adams County jobs, but perhaps the jobs that are provided as a result of all the activities that we, that we work with by ballot um, issue. And the first one is Proposition 101. Um, in 2011, we would have a loss, a potential loss of 103 jobs. By 2014, as a result of 101, 184 jobs. Amendment 60, 218 jobs, and that would stay the same throughout the, uh, uh, the, the four year period. Amendment 61 would be 13, so a total of 321 jobs beginning in 2011. 416, should those revenue uh, reductions occur. <coughs> the next slide is taking a look at all of our funds and the impact specifically to our funds. Uh, county government provides a, a number of services to the citizens across the entire county, including the jail, including our district attorney's office. We do run and operate regional parks. We do um, provide roads and bridges that many of the citizens of the city to also be on. Um, our general fund for 2010 was approximately just under $150 million. Um, as a result of these initiatives passing, that general fund would decline to $133 million, so that's about a $16 million reduction. Uh, the other significant part, part I would like to mention is also the Road and Bridge Fund would decline significantly and the Social Services Fund. And one thing to note, the Social Services Fund does receive a lot of revenue from our federal and state sources to help match the county property tax dollars that go into uh, the services that we provide out of our Social Services Fund in the Human Services Department. And those funds, should we reduce, should our property taxes be reduced, so the, the ability to leverage those funds in federal and state dollars is also um, reduced, and that's not totally reflected in this particular slide. The next slide is um, what Proposition 101 does. We put all of our specific ownership taxes into our voter bridge fund. Um, we find that there's, a, there's, a, that there's a, an access with people paying for their automobiles and, and using that money for roads and bridges in Adams County. The impact in 2011 would be $8.2 million. The next Item would be $10.3 million in 2012, 2013, $12.5 million, and that's $14.7 million. Total impact into the road bridge fund. Um, the next slide. So in 2011, the impact of uh, Proposition 101 by fund is primarily impacting our road and bridge fund. And the next slide after this one will show you what the impact in 2014 would be. And, and the $6 million uh, road and bridge fund item has grown to $12.6 million for 2014 because the specific ownership tax is reduced over a period of four. <coughs> so we just wanted to highlight that for me. Um, and then the next slide, please. And then property tax impact by fund. So, um, the general fund, $14.9 million, a road bridge, $846 million, which I would know we do share with uh, Commerce City and our other cities, a portion of that, no levy. Um, our social services fund, $1.5 million, and the government is able to $167,000, or a total of $17 million. Okay. Okay. Um, next slide. So this is the next slide. Um, and we'll for around the after I get that. Is that the end of my slide? The last point I wanted to make on this last slide is just 
the show, we do get a significant amount of state revenue, as you have heard um, from uh, my fellow uh, presenters tonight about the impact on the state and the state of the issues that they have. What would be the impact if they were not able to help fund some of the activities that they fund that are, they fund it, that, that fund Adams County activities? Because we do get a significant amount of revenues from, from the state and Adams County, primarily the social services department matches to um, our social services programs. So the impact there, these are potential. We do not know what the state will do as a result of lower revenues on there. Behalf, but we just wanted to represent how much state dollars we get in Adams County, and if the state decides to do um, budget cuts or pass any cuts onto uh, other entities at the local government level, there could be some significant impacts to Adams County that we wanted to show here. So that concludes the presentation. There are some significant impacts and revenues for Adams County, and we appreciate the opportunity to share these with you tonight. And, um, Happy to answer the questions. Council here. Good evening. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Um, the other night we had a ward meeting. Uh, Commissioner Larry Page um, spoke on behalf of the county. Um, I agree with everything everyone tonight is saying, but I need to ask you something privately before you leave, because it'll take just a second. After the rest of the question. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your being here. Thank you for taking your time. I agree you to be here as well. Thanks. Thank you for your time. And uh, Mr. Cordero, our last. Do we have one more? Two more. Okay. Good evening, members of council. At this point, I would like to invite uh, to the podium Ron LaPena with the South Adams County Fire Department.
in the fire district. Again, percentage-wise, it is equal to all entities, but this is going to affect, it's just that the dollar numbers aren't as staggering as they are to the uh, school districts. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Councilwoman, <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> did I understand that correctly? That we would be looking at from going from a two point nine million dollar budget to seven hundred eighteen thousand. That's that's what we are calculating. The debt proposition, or excuse me, Amendment sixty, is interpreted to its literal. Term. Well, that's a huge. Cut. Um, are we looking at, uh, I don't know what your operating expenses are, so uh, I guess I could foresee where we would have to maybe close fire stations in the future. I mean, I don't know. Um, uh, you guys' this training would be terribly impacted. Uh, does the public really want to support their fire department if they can't be trained, if you're not going to give any money for that? That's correct. We, the training budget for this year is over four hundred thousand dollars in training equipment and supplies, um, things of that nature. <coughs> and new accessories, replacement accessories for the apparatus, and things of that nature. We will not be able to at least purchase any any more equipment. Um, an at the cost of an average pumper is about three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars. An aerial can be upwards of $1.2 Yes, yeah, thank you for sharing that because I have heard some uh, citizens in, in our uh, city say that uh, it wouldn't impact our fire department. Well, it will impact our fire department. It will impact them greatly. So, uh, <clears throat> even though we are volunteer, um, uh, it, it, there's many things like what you're saying that on a day-to-day -day basis Service fire trucks that are in, in the service training for our firefighters, so they're at the highest quality firefighters. Um, it, it takes money to keep these stations open. Yeah, that's correct. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming and presenting that. Yes, we are not a paid department, it is 100% volunteer organization. There's no impact on salaries, but operations will greatly be affected by these. It truly comes down to people's lives. You know, it really does. Your ability to serve, you know, in South Adams County and everything that you do, you know, really comes down to lives. And, you know, you cannot put a price on people's lives. The response to fires, accidents, everything that you guys do, you can't put a price on that. And so that, that's a pretty heavy price to, to, to pay when you think about the ramifications of the situation for the fire district. So. That's and one other potential ramification that this could have is if we cannot provide the service to people within our jurisdiction, the insurance service office who rates fire departments based on their ability to fight fires and respond to fires, and that organization, the ISO Insurance Service Office, also sets rates for homeowners insurance and property or uh, commercial insurance as well. If, if we cannot provide the service, the, we potentially will have an increase in our liability, which will have, potentially could have an impact increasing homeowner premium for insurance as well as commercial insurance. Yeah, I think that that's uh, something that a lot of people don't understand. So I appreciate you explaining that. I think that's a very important piece as well. Councilman, is here. Hi, Ron. Thanks for coming and sharing all this uh, bad information of uh, this past season. And I agree with uh, with uh, Ms. Snyder that safety here and, and lives, more importantly than anything, will be, you know, very risky if this passes. And also, will you tell all the firefighters, I thank all of them for their volunteerism? Thank you. Councilman Besson. Yes, thanks for uh, being here uh, tonight, Ron. Thanks for sending uh, Laura Barnett on Wednesday night for our uh, 
for me. I apologize that I wasn't able to attend, but I understand it was a very informative presentation. Certainly. There's a lot of information that I'm going to have to get out there and get my knowledge in their hands so I'm trying to get them more information. Um, one of the points that he made is that, you know, right now, as far as the equipment is concerned, we'll have the equipment that we've got now. Four or five years down the road, when that equipment starts wearing out, there's not going to be any money to buy new equipment. That's correct. Um, and that, um, and I guess just my personal observation is that we're, we're fortunate that we've got a volunteer fire department because the paid fire department is going to suffer a lot more. You're talking about losing 74% just about of your uh, revenue. So the paid fire departments are really going to suffer because of this. And a lot more would be said. In my opinion, yes, they would be yeah. they would be impacted severely by well. Well we're going to be impacted a lot, but they, they would be impacted even more. Okay, thank you. Great. Last meeting we have uh Council McCarson. Well, I just want to say again that um, <clears throat> and equipment is expensive, and equipment is essential to what you do. The training is also essential. And when you are going to impact the training budget, uh, I, I don't know what kind of impact, but it's going to be a great impact, I would assume. Uh, when, when I need a firefighter because I've been in a model accident <clears throat> and I need to be extricated from that vehicle, I want to have a training. Um, and, and we do, we do a lot of training. And it needs to stay that way. Um, I, 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 I don't know how anybody can function under this. I, I really don't know how to survive. I don't know how anybody can survive. So, so yes, uh, like I said, uh, uh, it, it's a costly service. Um, and we did recently see um, somewhere that here in the state of Colorado that um, somebody, <coughs> there was residents paying into his private fire department. Correct. Is this the line of where we're going? That if you want safety, you you pay into this this uh, private fund so that you are protected? Uh, because there's a cost to these things. There, there is a true cost. So. There is a very financial impact in providing volunteer fire funding service. There, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Councilman Benson. Yeah, just uh, piggyback on something that. Uh, Council Member Carson said, um, you know, I told people that, uh, you know, you're supposed to be saving about, uh, what do they say, about $1,500 a year in taxes, things that are called taxes, right. and yet things may become privatized, and you're going to wind up paying a lot more. I mean, your cash flow is going to increase, your, the, the taxes are going to decrease, but your total cash flow over the year or two years is going to substantially decrease because you're going to be paying a lot more once those services are privatized. So, I, I don't that's know. A, that's how we understand it. I just wish that everybody could attend some of these meetings like this and hear um, the facts. Uh, but okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to get into the core Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. And last but not least, um, I would like to invite up to the podium Mr. Jim Jones to speak on the facts of how these three ballot measures may impact the South Adams Water and Sanitation District. Good evening, Mr. Jones. How are you? Good, very good. Here. Good evening, members of the council, members of the public. Um, we're a little different than everybody else. Everybody else tonight has been talking about lost uh, revenue sources and cut taxes and things. Uh, we actually have increased costs because of, the, of these uh, proposed amendments and propositions. Amendment 60, uh, because we are operated on water and sanitation um, functions or operated as enterprise funds uh, so that we can meet the paper requirements, uh, because they're enterprise funds, uh, all of our assets, our property assets, would be taxed. That's not it's all public property right now. As we have a couple of properties not taxed, uh, but because we're enterprise funds, our property uh, would be taxed. We have about $330 million of assets. Uh, we think that once we go through the assessment process and figure out how much we need to tax, uh, we think that impact would be about $1.5 million a year if we add to our uh, 
partners that would be a direct increase in, in our cost of doing business. Uh, we would also, as a, as a result of the end of the lose a small portion of our property taxes. Now, so combined, we'd probably be looking at anywhere from a 11 to 16 percent increase that we would have to pass on to our customers for our water and sewer costs uh, to maintain the services that we currently provide. And then at 61, uh, the impact that that would have on us is everybody knows when you're talking about water. Wastewater projects, you're talking about uh, projects that are intended to last 50 to 100 years. And you're talking about things like water resource projects, uh, diversion structures, creeks and rivers, uh, dams, uh, water storage projects, wastewater plants, water plants, really expensive projects that can cost anywhere from 10 to 100 million dollars. And we have several of those uh, in our plans for the next 20 to 30 years. So we have some of these big projects. When we have those big projects, we feel that it's most prudent and best for us to finance them over uh, 20 to 30 years so that we can spread those costs out. Similar to buying a, a home, most of us can't afford to pay cash for that home. Uh, it makes more sense that we can function and stay within our budgets to finance those over a period of time. So if we lose that ability uh, to finance those large projects, uh, we anticipate that that's going to take, and we just looked at over the next uh, seven to 10 years, we're going to have to have constant 7% increases in addition to everything else, just so we have money so that we can pay cash for those big projects as they, as they occur in the next several years. So those are huge impacts to us and will be huge impacts to our customers. The last thing, uh, Proposition 101, doesn't have a as big effect on us. We currently get about $120,000 a year out of some of those miscellaneous uh, property taxes. Uh, so if we were to lose those, uh, then that would be about a 1% uh, increase that we would have to pass on to our customers. So, uh, you know, we already know that we're going to have to do uh, some rate increases over the next several years without these things passing. You know, we have kind of have what we call the perfect storm. Uh, we've got the Klein OM Fund. It was funded by the federal government in 1989. It was intended the last 25 years. So in 2014, uh, those funds that the federal government gave us were going out. So uh, we have to start picking up the cost to operate that water plant. That's about one and a half to $2 million. Uh, the second thing we have is we've got an aging system. We've got a 60 year old system of water and sewer pipes that's uh, started. A uh, have some issues that we need to uh, get some attention to to make sure that we keep up with those. And, uh, you know, we're going to have some increases to keep up with those costs. We've got intergovernmental agreements with Denver Water and, and Metro Wastewater. They're really good things for the community to ensure long-term water and, and wastewater service for the community. But those, long or those agreements have some end costs in them, so we have to be able to, to maintain those. So we already know that we have to do some modest increases over the next several years, if, if these measures were to pass, we would have to significantly increase those, those rate increases and pass them on to our customers. So we're concerned about that and, and, and glad to have the opportunity to share that information. Thank you, sir. Um, I do have a couple questions uh, from the council members. I agree with that. Sure. Okay, council member Randall. Mr. Jones, thank you for being here tonight and presenting. Um, I think you. You bring up a, a great point that's often overlooked, and it's that uh, these are reported to be tax-reducing measures, tax-cutting measures, but also within that language includes new taxes, never before uh, seen taxes on special districts. Uh, so things like our water district, our DIA, uh, some colleges and universities, those will not have to pay property tax. And I think that's something that's overlooked, so uh, thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. Thank you, Councilwoman Peter. Yes, good evening. Nice to meet you again. Just by the other night and listened in as well. Um, later on in the meeting, very shortly, I'm going to bring forward a resolution, um, a joint resolution with the other entities that were up here tonight. Would you like to be included with that? Or do you need to get approval from your board? We need to know pretty quickly on what you're going to do without us. Our board can actually consider their own resolution um, Wednesday night. They're having a special meeting, so we'll, they'll be considering a, a resolution uh, for the same, same thing. I didn't get it. Uh, well, maybe ask if they want to join this. will be more very powerful without me. So thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Council.
come from the book? Um, trying to add it all up in my head, uh, the different percentages that you got out there, and I got to around 25% before you started adding uh, in the future that uh, you're going to have some rate increases and things coming down the road. So not to scare anyone, but added on to that 25%, where would we kind of end up in around about 2014 um, with the rate increases percentage-wise? Right now, with, with kind of the things that we're just normally doing on the side of these, we're, we're looking at um, something around a, a 9% increase next year, 9% uh, increase the year after that, 5% for a couple of years, and then we'll be kind of just inflationary. That's our, that was our rate strategy uh, to, to get to a good competitive uh, rate structure. Uh, on top of this, so you'd be looking at uh, in the first year, probably about 28% increases just in the first year once these become effective. Um, and then after that, uh, you'd probably be looking at levels um, around probably the 15 to 18% for like four or five years after that. Thank you, sir. Seeing no further questions for you, thank you for being here and taking your thank time to be here this evening. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cordero, I, I have a question for you that maybe you can answer for me. Um, I, I'm pretty well versed on um, the amendments and the proposition, but my question for you is, where did it, uh, who was the original? I mean, how did this come to be? Could you give us a little, just a quick history on that? Uh, well, I think that that's, that's still the $64,000 question. That's what I keep and hearing. <laughs> That there are there are court challenges right now, um, trying to get at who is funded, who funded the efforts okay. to collect the, the amount of signatures that were collected to get these on the ballot. And as of right now, those efforts in the courts have not produced uh, culprit, if you will, have not produced someone who is responsible for the efforts. So we couldn't tell you right now who who is uh, behind. I find it really interesting that we have millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of loss, you know, that could potentially come from these three, but yet we couldn't, we don't even know who brought it forward or who's to blame or who at the end of the day even started this. I mean, do you know, does anyone find that fascinating? So I just wanted to bring it up and see if it, I mean, because I've asked this question to several people and have yet to get a clear answer, so I see there still isn't one. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Cardo. Oh, yes, Councilwoman Teeter. Okay, um, at this time I would like to direct uh, Mr. Gaylor, our city attorney, to bring forward a joint resolution including Commerce City, uh, Brighton, I, I mean School District 27, J. Adams County, Adams County 14, and I'm missing, and South Adams County Volunteer Fire Department. And also if uh, the county comes forward in the next few days for the water district if they want to be included as well. Would this be ready, Mr. Gaylor, by next Monday? Uh, Mr. Gaylor, just a quick question for you. Are we able to do that as a governmental entity and council members? Are we able to do that? I don't see any problem with doing that. Okay. Uh, you know, we already passed one resolution, so this would just be a second resolution along the same line. So I think this one would be joined with other um, governmental entities to adopting a resolution that I would assume then that they would also be adopting. So then we would just be looking for a consensus this evening to have to draw up a, a resolution that we could look at next week. Right. Yeah. Okay, all right. A Councilman Moreno? Yes. Councilman Benson? A Councilman McCarthy? Yes. Uh, Councilman Bullock? Yes. Councilman Johnson? Yes. Councilman Teeter? Yes. And that's a yes for myself, so it's unanimous. And we'll look forward to seeing that resolution for vote next week. Okay, moving on. I will now ask, ask Acting City Manager Lynette Neelan to introduce staff to provide, provide us an update on Adams County 120th Avenue, Highway 85 intersection, preservation and property annexation update. And who will be our presenter tonight? Mr. Aker? All right. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Acting Mayor and members of Council. 
Let me pull up a diagram really quick. It may help if we have some questions. This is a, um, a joint effort project that has involved Commerce City and Adams County um, along with the property owner. And it goes back, we've been talking with the county for well over a year on how to solve a potential dilemma that they had. They had a property owner, um, well, let me start. Adams County has been spearheading an effort to preserve right-of-way for a future great separated crossing of, a high, of Highway 85 with the 120 of Adams. This is a project that is way out in the future, but one of Adams County's uh, high-priority projects, and one which uh, Commerce City has agreed from a transportation standpoint is a high-priority project for, for Adams County. The continued work that Adams County has done on 120 of five building bridge of the South Platte and then future improvements that uh, we see in the future to widen 120 at least for the airport. What happened is uh, Brighton, uh, a property owner bought a piece of property that was located generally in this area here, um, north of the current 120, but it would be within the slope of where the um, great separated crossing would be. Adams County had some property that was left over from when they did the 120 um, improvements here that was approximately in this location. That's in Commerce City's growth area. The property owner had actually submitted a permit and plans to write and they were ready to build and everyone discovered that this was about to happen. And to keep the cost down in the future and not have to relocate a business, the county came to us along with the property owner and asked the city of you know, how could we work together to continue to let this person plan and build with the budget he had set, um, but also recognize the need that this property would need to annex and come to at some time in the future. Also, Adams County was looking for partners in this right-of-way preservation, preservation project. Commerce City let them know that financially we think we've already contributed. We purchased some property here several years ago on the south side when we became aware of the potential for the intersection <coughs> um, great separation that was uh, I think it was about four lots that was part of the Stillwater or part of the Stillwater subdivision in this area so it's decided we should acquire that before houses built um, and we calculated that if we don't collect some fees if it's built in the county and city of the city um, we've made a pretty good um, contribution to that project which will benefit Congress City. With that in mind, um, staffs have worked together. We've um, gone down the path of allowing them to build in the county and then immediately annex in the Commerce City, uh, which is required uh, due to some of our agreements with the Water District and the General Improvement District. Uh, so we've moved that forward. Unfortunately, as you'll see in the packet, both Adams County and the property owner did sign the agreement. They actually signed the agreement once we said, hey, we think we're done with the agreement, they came back to us signed. So we're uh, playing catch up in some respects, um, but um, we think in overall this will be a benefit for the community and for the city to um, get this property annexed into the city and also provide some preservation to the in the future. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Aker, thank you for your presentation, and I see no questions on the board. I have a question. You're not on the board. Oh, okay. <laughs> Councilman Bullock. Uh, if you could point out again where this property is that we're talking about. Right the here. property that the landowner is building on, which is in our area, is currently right in this area here. If you drive down 120 right now, you see kind of a red and yellowish uh, uh, metal building being built uh, on the south side of 120. And it's on the west side of 120. West side of 85. West side of 85. Tomahawk truck stop, or not Tomahawk, uh, tail feathers is in this area. Okay. Okay, I'm aware of what you're speaking about now. Any other questions, Councilman Bolk? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Eric. Thank you. We'll come back in the next week or, next week or so with an actual resolution to. I'll try to
sign of the agreement. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, moving on to administrative council business. Councilman Moreno. Do you have any administrative business? <laughs> uh, just, just one thing. Uh, I, uh, well, I'll just say I, I'm even more incredibly impressed with uh, our city publication. Um, it's really taking on that flavor of being a comprehensive community update rather than just getting news from the city. I think that's great. Um, I would like um, council's consensus um, on moving forward of, with the idea I presented last week about the derby businesses that have maybe been impacted by the construction, if we can maybe offer them uh, some free ad space in our next publication in conjunction with announcing the ribbon cutting for the Derby Plaza next month. Uh, so I just wanted council's approval to, to work with, I'm assuming it would be Mr. Cordero um, or Ms. Morris uh, to uh, offer that to, to the businesses in Derby. Uh, city Attorney, is that appropriate to our city manager? Um, I'd just like to give some feedback. Uh, staff has been working on a policy since it's a, um, a public, we're not in compete, competition with the private sector. Right. And we've been looking at policies on this and we took your recommendation to heart last week and we're looking at something we would like to come back to you and see how we can best handle that. Great. And our hope maybe is next week when we come to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Instead of going down the line, I'm just going to give you one we'll just press the button. If they have any administrative business, um, I see Kelsey and Bullock. Uh, yes. Um, in our publication, and I've brought this up a couple of times, it shows my picture and it shows a cell phone number that I don't know who that belongs to. Okay. That is not my cell phone number, and I need to get my correct cell phone number with my picture because a lot of people tell me they called that and they uh, got somebody in the city that is not me. So, uh, I would like to we'll get that corrected. Okay, thank you. Can I get that corrected for him? <laughs> thank you. Okay, I don't see any. Oh, Councilman Moreno. Just to piggyback on Mr. Bullock, that my cell phone number is also wrong on that. It at least goes to uh, my city office phone, though, so I get messages that way, but it would be nice to have my mobile phone there. I think on behalf of staff, we're going to check everybody's stuff. Thank you. Awesome. And then just one other thing. Uh, I was walking around every day. Um, the the large tree that we planted in the, the plaza looks a little unhealthy, so I don't know if staff has has uh, has seen that or not. But the, the branches towards the towards the bottom are, are kind of drying out, so I'm just worried about the overall health of the tree because. Uh, I think that's going to be like the centerpiece of the Derby Winter Festival, so the staff are just looking to that. Thank you, Councilman. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind uh, asking City Manager Newman, look overlooking, you know, just taking a look, quick look at everybody's names and uh, phone numbers and email addresses. It took six years to get my name spelled properly, so if you could just have those looked at, that would be great. Appreciate that. Okay, Councilman Benson. Do we allow editorials in this publication? Of course, editorials are opinions. We haven't been approached by that yet. Um, so I think one of the great things that I recall about the, the Beacon was that there were editorials, and people had the ability to send in uh, letters to the editor or whatever. And I thought that was a, a major part of that, in addition to reporting the news. I had a chance to write into the weekends. I don't know how would the rest of the council feel about them to allow letters to the editor or editorial opinions to be submitted to the editor. Um, city attorney Taylor, or you know, how do you guys? How would you, or acting city manager Neil, how would you like to weigh in on that? Because this is kind of a different situation than a privately owned newspaper, so I'm not sure how that no, works. I'd like. There's probably a legal answer and a policy answer. Okay. And, and just talking to uh, Deputy City Manager Neal in here, and she'd like to look into the options on that, and then get back to the council rather than give her a legal opinion. Mm -hmm. May not have any real basis for what you want to do as a policy matter. <coughs> That's definitely to you, Council Vincent. Could we ask for a consensus of the council, and the council direct that be done? 
Do we need a consensus of the council, sir? We'll just agree. I agree as long as the council feels comfortable with spending time. It's not a question that's been posed, so I think it's a good question. Is that acceptable for you, Councilman Vincent? Sure. Uh, we're going to start with the reports now. Yeah, Councilman Randall. Um, well, I'll just say I, I didn't get a chance to, to uh, say anything about what, what Jim just brought up. I think it is an interesting question, and I look forward to the report coming back from staff. I think part of the question is we need to ask ourselves which direction we're going. If, uh, if our city newsletter, or, or I don't know what we're calling it, our paper, city news, is going to be a kind of a comprehensive community update from the city or if we're actually going to try to turn this into a newspaper. That's obviously one, something that's, that's for study and I think it's a good question to ask. Um, other than that, I, I don't have a report. Thank you, sir. Councilman Benson? Yes, thank you. Well, we've heard several times about our one week last Wednesday, September 22nd. And I wanted to thank uh, Councilmember uh, Teeter. Uh, she and I put about $1,000 of our discretionary money to uh, financing this. We sent out about, what, there's about 3,800 uh, mailers. We did do local calls, and uh, uh, I thought it was very successful. We had not only the people that I'm about to mention to you, but we had about 85 citizens. I was a little, we had more in January of 08, and I'm thinking that we're going to have more as time goes on to continue to do this. I, I would just like to ask the council to think about spending you know, a few thousand dollars to pay for these uh, mayors because I think they have a major effect on the attendance that we get at these meetings. And I think uh, we just got filled up the cafeteria at the second week elementary. Um, anyway, I want to thank Kathy Dieter for calling in for me and co hosting this event. Also, I want to thank uh, Liz for doing a lot of the legwork and uh, handling a lot of things, I guess. So, Liz, stand up for me. <laughs>
Thanks very much. That's all. Thank you, sir. Councilwoman Carson. Uh, I, I really don't have a report. I just wanted to thank uh, Councilman Benson and Councilman Peter for the award meeting. Um, it was very nice to attend to. I think that I wanted to turn out. Um, and then I think that uh, uh, some of our citizens, uh, I did recognize people from the South End there who realized that it's, whether it's your ward or not, you, yeah. you are more than welcome to any of these board meetings at any time. Um, and, and thank you, staff, because you did do a very good job there. I know it was a lot of work. Uh, I think it's a great outreach, and I would like to see maybe that we continue along these lines of this type of outreach. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Bullock. Yes, I'd like to tell you all the things that I missed on uh, by being in uh, Philadelphia at the National League of Cities uh, Leadership Summit leading the charge. Uh, I missed the ward meeting, and I regret that. I missed the uh, Historical Society picnic, and I regret that. I missed the National Prescription Take-Back Day. Even though they were doing that in um, Philadelphia also, it was a nationwide thing. I didn't have nothing to give them, so uh, it's like I missed it. But what I did receive was a lot of good knowledge in this summit. And taking charge of your cities and not shirking or shirking or shrinking from your duty as council people and staff and everything that, you know, we are put in charge by the citizens to do a job. And sometimes that job gets overwhelming, but it's something that you get better with it as you go along. And the one thing that somebody said that just um, resonated with me is that if you have a crisis, get it all out. Get it out to the public. Because bad news does not get better with age. So if you knock it off right away and give everybody the information about bad news, it's done with. And all you have to do is proceed to the good news from there. But if you try to hide something, it's something that will just keep reaching up and biting you because it will always be there. So, I mean, if it's one thing I will always remember, and I'm going to show that this is one of the things that if we ever have a problem here in Commerce City, we will get it out and the citizens will know as much as we do right in the beginning because once we've got it out there, all we have to do is act and make it a better situation. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you, Councilman Bullock. Councilman Johnson? Sure, Councilman Speaker? Yes, uh, quickly. I'm being redundant now, but I must uh, thank uh, you, Mr. Vincent, for putting most, most of the organization together on the board meeting. And I think it was very successful. We had a lot of um, positive comments from people. And thank you to um, Ms. Carson and Mr. Reno for attending. That meant a lot to us. And the sound man from CML, the uh, police chief, Brittany, Tom, Josh, all the speakers and the staff that put this together. And, and like I said, a lot of times people that live far away uh, with their busy lives can't travel this far. And so I said, we're bringing the city there. And it was the well received. I also on Thursday attended the Adams County Economic Development Luncheon and wish I had not stayed there and listened to the speakers because they had two expert speakers on what's going to happen when the Bush tax, tax cuts in, especially small businesses, and I don't even think I want to own my business then, and um, complications and impacts when the new health care plan comes. So I just wanted to update that, and you don't really want to know all that anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, just a couple of things from me. Um, I attended uh, historical Society barbecue over at uh, the park there, and it, what a great event. That was a lot of fun. There were all kinds of people there. Um, we had some great cooks. We had Gene and his son cooking, so thank you for the cooking. They were great hamburgers and hot dogs, and we had uh, Troy Younger cooking, and uh, I just really appreciate everybody that went out there and helped set up and take down and all the hard work that was put into that. We had lots of visitors. We had Doug Dar and uh, Mark Nightcastle. Is that how you say his name? Yes, he's, the, he's one running against uh, Doug Dar for sheriff. 
we had uh, Congressman Perlmutter there. We had, uh, gosh, there was a slew of people out there. Who am I missing? Can you help me out? <laughs> yeah, everybody that was important. Yes, we had a great group, and I mean, it was just lovely. And people were asked to bring something that it was a historical, you know, little something that has a historical value to the city, and then you were supposed to guess the item that it was, and some of those items were pretty interesting. Um, I found that to be a really interesting thing and hope that, they, that we continue to do that. And there was a movie made of all of it and everybody you know, got to say who was there. And just from the historical value of getting the stories out from the seniors and everything, really I think it, you know, for the future, those are just gonna be irreplaceable memories. So I wanna thank everybody that was a part of that. It was really a wonderful day. Um, I'd like to thank Carolyn Keith in the Park and Rec Department. Um, I came to Carolyn about a week ago or two when um, some of the citizens over in the Freedom Park area asked me for another bench. There was only one bench over there at that park and it faced the sun. So when the children were playing in the afternoon, it became very warm. And so they wanted another bench um, facing the other direction. And Carolyn um, and her team got right on that, got that bench installed. So thank you for that. And um, I wanted to compliment the Cultural Council. Um, I hear very good things. Um, it's moving along very well and basically being reformed, new logo, new ideas, new everything. So, you know, I think it's really great when something that, you know, kind of stalled out, you know, turns around and is, is really becoming a good thing. So I want to thank Councilman Moreno and everyone who's participating on the Cultural Council for getting that up and running and moving forward in a positive direction. Um, I think that is all I have for now. Councilman Benson, did you have something? Yes, I just wanted to say I, I forgot uh, to mention Sam Babette. He's the executive director of Colorado Municipal League. If he did, uh, he reminded me of that. Of course, I sent out an email to everybody. I should have brought a copy of the email. He gave about a 10 or 15 minute overview of 60, 61, and 101. And we had various other people going into the impacts on their various government entities. We have a total of about 11 people um, making statements, and I guess uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, talking about the impact on their various jurisdictions of 6061 and So I just wanted to recognize the Sam because he did give us a lot of help. He's the best person in the state of Colorado to give a 10 or 15 I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Rana and everything that he does, and he does his best to make his way all over the state when things come up that are of importance to, um, to, to the municipal league and to the state of Colorado. So I would like to thank staff as well for making his appearance at your board meeting for all of the work that he does for the state of Colorado. Um, as you all know, I will be heading for San Jose in just a few hours. And um, one of the things that uh, we've been working on is uh, been forwarded to Washington and is sitting on the president's desk as we speak. So I hope to have a great report to present in the near future when I return um, for what is happening with the Public Safety and Crime Prevention Steering Committee. So looking forward to a long but exciting and busy week coming up. So I want to wish everyone a great week. Thank you for being here this evening and we are now adjourned. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Can we hold back on that one moment? Happy City Manager Newman. He didn't even go like this. You know, I did. <laughs> I think you're uh, changing things up for us to keep us awake here. So, um, we gave you your council update, and most of it is things that we have communicated via email, but just wanted to get it in hard copy. I'd like to highlight one thing that you may not be aware of when we try to anticipate questions. Uh, through the work of the NOL, there was a governor's uh, energy office had some grant opportunities. and. To get ahead of this, we went ahead and looked at all of those, and there were over um, 47 funding announcements, and we looked at those, and only two the city was able to go for. So we wanted to highlight that we take it seriously. One, we were, we were denied or didn't work out for us, and one we're still pursuing. So we are trying to anticipate questions. Um, a friendly reminder, the communication audit, um, our interviews are trying to end by this Friday, and I'll contact you to see if we can set something up or just would like your questionnaire. The important thing for us from the city council is if there's other people we should be talking to. We do have a limited budget, and I committed to work with the consultants and prioritize early this week, so if there's additional people we need to go talk to.
Um, in that, what I was thinking is the editorial issue as part of our update to council, I think it's going to be early November, of what the consultant recommends to us. I would like them to also look into the editorial issue. Though I hear the importance of the Derby ads, and I'll move that forward quickly. Um, and the same with the ward meetings update. I think council had, um, when you passed the motion to move forward, we committed to you after the first two board meetings to give you an update. And we'll come back to you and say, here's what we spent, here's how they work, and then we can receive further direction from you. So I will work with Ms. on that. Good news moments. Um, last week, our Parks and Rec Department went up to Breckenridge for their annual conference, and lo and behold, we received three awards. Um, they included the Colorado Parks and Recreation Association Outstanding New Professional was awarded to Jenna Johnson, the Recreational Coordinator uh, for Teams. The Columbine Award for Administration Management for the Commerce City Parks and Rec Department for Creating Community, a Staff Training and Community Awareness Program, and then the Columbine Award for Programming for Commerce City's Parks and Rec Department's Healthy Schools Partnership. And um, I think that's a fantastic um, recognition, and we will be setting something up so council can formally acknowledge the good work the staff is doing. Uh, Brittany, as we reported last week, was at the uh, like Aviation as a Catalyst for Economic Development Conference, and she got very good information back from Dallas and uh, Detroit on how that economic development has spread like wildfire to the areas surrounding the airports, and they call them um, Aerotropolis. But what she also learned is DIA is in the process of hiring a consultant to study the economic development opportunities inside and outside the airport, and Commerce City will be included in the study, and Brittany will be taking lead in the effort. So that's another good news moment. It shows good how we go out and staff participates. Um, we got a congratulations to uh, Lieutenant San uh, Sonia. Today he returned back from the uh, FBI Academy. And so I asked uh, uh, Commander Wu, and he said he's just a little bit smart now. So yeah, that's a good thing. It, it is uh, Baca, Baker, and Wu are the, I mean, sorry, the FBI National Academy are the only three others from our force that have gone. So I think that's a great accolade to see that part of the development. Um, economic developer Ruby Morris just wants to make sure. We remember we have the business appreciation breakfast this Friday morning. And it's here in council chambers from 7 to 8, 7 to 9 a.m. And the city will present four awards to the outstanding businesses in our community. Um, Ms. the two flyers on your uh, dais. One is with the race on 10 10 10, with uh, several of our community partners. And then the second is uh, the Nine Health Fair, which was the third annual for Commerce City Family Nine Health Fair. Uh, this year has changed the form of where, where it's being hosted. It's going to be at the Adams City High School. It's on Saturday and Sunday, November 6th and 7th. Um, Laura's been working with the boards and commissions. And uh, last year, when we established the budget to celebrate um, our board, our, our participation by boards and commissions members, uh, that budget was cut um, through some recommendations of the boards and commission members, and then we brought it to council. So this year, we're going to, uh, we took the money and leveraged it, and you'll have um, a casual reception with light food before city council meeting, and then we'll have them come in, and city council will recognize each board and commission meeting, and this will happen on November 1st. So we just wanted you to be aware of that. And then Public Works gave us a, an update on some of the projects. Um, CDOT scheduled for completion of the Highway 2 project from 64th into Quebec. Are any weather delays, it's on October 19th we should be done with that project. And Public Works has the overlay project on Colorado Boulevard and it's expected to be complete by the end of, of this week. And the last, the C1 ship application in the Fairfax Park neighborhood has been completed. So I hope that was comprehensive for you. So.
That was, I'm sorry I forgot you because you were loaded with information. So thank you. City Attorney Taylor. Yes, uh, City Council will be pleased to know and, and I want the citizens of Carmen City to know that last evening I uh, spoke to a sizable number of citizens uh, regarding the uh, upcoming election in November. And I emphasized in my talk the uh, severe effects that passage of Amendment 60, 61, and Proposition 101 would have on the ability of all levels of government uh, to provide services to the citizens of of the state. And when I, when I say all levels of government, of course, I'm including the state, the county, the, the cities, school districts, fire districts, water districts, library districts, any special district. And my talk was well received. There were lots of questions. And, and you know what's surprising is that as much publicity as there is out there regarding these issues, there's a surprising number of people that really don't know what those issues are about. And uh, this was an, an older group of people and uh, well-educated people. And the talk was very well received, but it was very informative for them because it was news to quite a number of them what was really happening with regards to the campaign and with regards to what would happen if the issue should pass. So I just wanted to, uh, you to know about that, and I hope that more of those opportunities can occur, both for you as, as city council members and for us as staff to be able to present the information regarding these issues. I appreciate that, City Attorney Taylor. I really do. I think that um, there are quite a few people out there that are still not really, you know, understanding how the, these things are going to affect us. So I think the more information that we can get out there, the better. Um, the one last thing that I have to mention that I almost forgot was on October the 5th from 5 to 7 at Betsy's Coffee Shop, Coffee Shop there in Derby. We are going to be having a senior summit where the seniors are invited to come and sit down with city council and voice any of their concerns or comments or anything that they want to talk to us about. So we would like to formally invite all of the seniors to come to Muzzy's Coffee Shop. Again, that's October the 5th from 5 to 7, and I look forward to seeing the seniors then. Now, now if anyone doesn't have anything else, then we are, this time, adjourned. Thanks.